Welcome to the show. I'm Nick Romico. Today we're in sunny Boulder, Colorado with InterNACHI Green Building Specialist Kent Shepard of Peak to Prairie Inspection Services and Stephen Kane of Namaste Solar Electric. And they're going to help me inspect this home and its PV system. You guys ready? Let's go. Let's do it. Okay, we're on the sunny side of the house. Looks like the solar panels are up on an unshaded section of the roof, right? That's right. They need to be where the sun can hit them because they're going to turn sunlight into electricity. And these are one of the systems that inspectors are liable to come on to a uh, project and find, and they need to know a little bit about them. Uh, basically, uh, there are two kinds of panels. These are, are, uh, these are flat panels. They're, they might also see shingles, which are photovoltaics. Um, by far the most common are these panels. They're actually modules. Um, which are fastened together into strings. Um, Stephen, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Sure. This particular system is a five kilowatt array. It's made up of 24, 215 watt solar PV panels. Uh, these are monocrystalline panels and very high efficiency. They produce about 610 kilowatt hours per month here in sunny Boulder, Colorado. That works all around a year, right? It does. We get a lot of sunshine year round here, nearly 300 days. So PV is a great product for Colorado. It starts out as DC electricity? That's right. The solar panels themselves produce DC current, which... Do you have an inverter or something? We do. We have to change that power into something the house can actually use, which would be an alternating current inverter. Uh, the DC current coming down from the array goes to the inverter. The inverter is also then connected to the house to make AC power. Great. What would an inspector look at up there? I'd say the most important factor for an inspector to look at for the panels on the roof is how secu securely they're connected to the roof. Uh, another thing you want to look for is to make sure none of the wires are dangling down on the asphalt shingles because as the snow melts, we could create wear and tear on that wire as, as that wire is rubbing against the shingles. So we want to make sure the wires are snug up against the bottom of the panels if possible. Probably uh, one thing inspectors did not want to do is get up there and grab a hold of the array. You first want to test it with a voltage tester just to make sure that there isn't current on the racks. So you can get shocked on the array? You could if there was something wrong. Absolutely. There's a bit of a safety concern. Let's make sure that these arrays are well grounded. Uh, most of the time, all the time, they, they typically are. But just from a safety perspective, let's check that there is no live voltage on the rack before you actually touch it. Okay. We're on the roof taking a little bit closer look at these panels. Stephen, is there anything uh, particular inspectors should know about the way they're mounted? Basically, uh, the mountings should be pretty similar to uh, to vent jacks and that sort of that sort of thing. Just uh, just to prevent leaks. Exactly. Yeah, we are really worried about uh, ice damming and uh, you know snow and melt cycles here in Colorado. In this particular case, this this was a new construction when we installed these standoffs, as they're called. So we were able to put a boot flashing around each of the pipes that we connected to the roof. Oftentimes we do retrofits. I'd say most of our most of our installations are retrofits, mm -hmm. where we're going on top of shingles that are already there. In case we will use a flashing product that will slide under the shingles, but actually get attached on top of the shingles below it. Um, we just want to make sure that we use a good silicon-based uh, sealant as well on our lag bolts that are going into those trusses because uh, these systems are going to last 30 or 40 years. We want to make them as leak-proof as possible. So if it's a retrofit, inspectors should be looking to make sure that uh, the uh, standoffs are sealed with, a, with some kind of sealant, a proper sealant, and that uh, there's um, space enough beneath the, the uh, panels for air to circulate so that they stay cool those and are, that they're securely mounted. Those are great things to look for. Thanks, Stephen. Hey, thank you. Okay, so I'm on a home inspection. I come around the corner and I see all this. It appears to be a big box with a heat sink on it, two disconnects, a lightning arrestor. What is it? What's going on? Well, what you're looking at here is what we call the balance of systems. It's basically everything besides the solar PV panels that are on the roof or on the ground. This big box is called an inverter. That's what makes the power change from DC to AC so that your house can use the alternating current. These two gray boxes are called disconnects. They're primarily for safety. If I'm going to work on the array, I want to be able to shut off power from it. 
And this other disconnect over here is an AC disconnect that's required by the utility for safety for their linemen. They want to be able to turn the system off if they need to work on the lines in the neighborhood. But it automatically goes off if it if the power grid goes down, so it doesn't hurt a lineman, am I right? You're exactly correct. It's got a UL listing that it must sh shut off within a certain period of time for safety reasons. And so this whole system doesn't work when the power grid is off. That's correct. This is a batteryless grid intertype system, is the way we call it. Some systems can have a battery bank to supplement your power when the grid goes down. Those cost a little bit more, and there's some more complex wiring, but it's certainly a doable option. And we don't lose power here very often in Boulder. We have pretty solid grid. Now I noticed these, um, the AC disconnect and the, and the uh, oh, this is the AC disconnect and the DC disconnect. You could probably lock them if you have kids here, right? Absolutely. The reason those locks are on there on the AC side is so that the utility can lock you out. But if you do have kids around and you're worried about little fingers getting into things, by all means, we can lock those up. Or a twist tie or something to keep them out of there. Exactly. Okay, so what is going on? From the collectors on the roof, where does the power come from, Tim? Well, it comes down from the collectors and it goes into the DC disconnect. And so it's DC at this point. Right, and that should be clearly labeled. Um, from the DC disconnect, it goes into the inverter. Inverters will vary in size depending on the size of the collection system. And the heat sink, we're on the cool side of the house with underneath a carport. Is it important for it to be kept out of the sun? They need to stay cool, and being in the, in the shade helps them stay cool. Uh, inspectors may also hear a fan running because some systems have fans which help them keep cool. This one doesn't, but the one next door does, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, and on this side, there's an AC disconnect. Um, that should also be clearly labeled. Those are, those are uh, the three main pieces that an inspector will see. That's what they are. Um, an inspector will want to confirm that the system is actually working by looking at the, at the readout. Um, right now, this one gives a variety of information. Um, it switches back and forth. Sooner or later, it's going to tell the total output from the collectors, and you'll know the system's working. Some you tap them to get them to. Some you wrap with your thumb, with your with your knuckles, and it will change the readout. Okay. And where is the AC going into? Into a breaker box, I assume, somewhere. The AC goes into a breaker box and connects to a a, a, a back feed breaker. That's correct. On this system, we have a 30 amp, two full, two pole, 240 volt backfeed breaker. And by backfeed breaker, I just mean it's another source of current on the bus bar in the electrical mains panel for the house's loads to use. One more thing that inspectors can confirm in this area, uh, you can't see it on this particular house, but on a lot of houses, they'll see conductors coming down from the collectors in conduit. Right. And if that conduit enters the house, it needs to be metal conduit. If it stays outside, it can be plastic conduit. Okay. Let's go see the breaker panel. Sounds good. Right. From the panel, from the AC disconnect, power comes into a main panel, usually a, a, a main panel in the house, but not always, and goes directly to a backfeed breaker. And Stephen, would you like to tell us a little bit about the backfeed breaker? Sure. Basically, what we have here is on this top slot a two pole, 240 volt, 30 amp breaker. There's currently a provision in the code that doesn't allow you to exceed the bus rating of a panel by more than 20% in a residential application with a backfeed breaker. Uh -huh. Consequently, that means that we're limited to about 30 amps. As you can see, Excel comes in, the utility comes in through the top main lugs at 200 amp service. We tie in here to the same bus bar. We're both providing sources of current for all of the household loads. Uh -huh. So all of these other breakers are first using the solar PV current, and when that's not quite enough, they pull from the grid to make up the difference. I see. If in the event that we produce more power than the house is using during the day, that surplus power goes through this breaker and actually out to the utility and makes the meter spin backwards. So I see an awful lot of breakers there. If I'm just coming in and don't have you with me, how am I going to know which one it is? Good question. Hopefully the system is labeled in the AC panel clearly and identified with a specific label for the PV breaker. It's part of the inspection process. The inspector should catch that. Okay, got it. Uh, is there anything else we need to know about the PV panel while I've got this panel open? Not really. You may also see a lightning arrestor in the AC panel. Oftentimes we put two lightning arrestors on our systems, on the DC side and the AC side, to absorb some extra voltage should we have some lightning in the area. 
So is one more necessary than another? Do we need to confirm that one or the other is there? Neither one is required. Neither one is absolutely necessary. It's something that us as installers, we go above and beyond by adding this extra safety. So, um, so, you, so a, a, a PV system may not have um, any kind of lightning protection? That's correct. I think that they should, but it's not required. Gotcha. Okay, we're at the electric meter on the home. What about this meter is different than the average meter? It's a good question. The normal meters on most houses are socketed so that they will only spin in one direction. It's really important when you have a PV system that you have a meter that can spin both ways. Because as we were talking about sending our current back to the grid or back to the utility, we need to be able to spin that meter backwards to facilitate that. So this is what's called a net meter. Uh, and that's what it says on the labels too. Exactly. Our utility here in, in Colorado is Excel and they put stickers on their meters to identify them as a special meter. Most houses won't have meters like this unless they have a solar PV system. Now I understand some PV systems are still using an, an old meter that isn't bi-directional. And there's a financial implication to that, isn't there? There is, there is. Some older systems that were installed, say around Y2K, didn't get net meters. And because they only spin one way, the homeowner is actually doubly billed for any power they send back to the grid. So you really want to have one of these meters to make the financial uh, financials work for the system. So um, we have Excel here in Colorado. Other states may have other providers. Uh, are inspectors in other states liable to run into meters that will spin both directions but don't have any labeling on them? Absolutely. There are probably hundreds of variables out there for inspectors to look for. Some utilities will even have two meters, one designated meter for just the solar production and then one regular house meter. So is there any way for an inspector to know whether they've got a bi-directional meter or not? Simply the sticker is the only way that I'm currently aware of. You can also look at some of the codes that are on the meter themselves. So today they have some X's by the special features. Some of them actually say bi-directional on there with an X or time of use meter with an X, some special features that way. So an inspector, if he can't confirm that it's a net meter, probably ought to state that and he might want to photograph the codes on the meter itself and, and, uh, and that way you'd have a record of, of, uh, of the code and, and it could be confirmed by, by uh, the utility company whether or not it, would, it was a bi-directional meter. I think that's a great idea because as a home inspector you want to make sure that this system is gaining value for the new homeowner and this is a key place for it to actually gain that value. But isn't there something about the meter itself? That's right. Aside this from the stickers? This particular meter is a digital net meter. If you remember the old meters were analog and they had discs. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you can imagine the disc spinning this way if you're buying power, it will actually spin the opposite way if you're selling power back to the grid. In this case, there are three little dots that blink. And those actually vary by intensity of amperage that you're sending. If it's blinking really slow, you're only barely sending any power back. If it's blinking really fast, you're sending a lot of current back. It looks, looks like it saves the overall credit, too. Yes, this homeowner currently is about 50 kilowatt hours to the good. I understand he got a check already. Last year, yeah, in the wintertime, this homeowner got a, got a credit from the Excel, from utility company, because he overproduced compared to his consumption. So in other words, the system made more energy than he used. That's correct. Okay. It doesn't always work economically to oversize your system because he was only paid in a wholesale or off, offset rate. So he wasn't paid 10 cents a kilowatt or whatever. He, he was wasn't paid, paid retail rate, he was paid only four. wholesale, exactly. Okay. I noticed in the three, the three dots you mentioned, this is going from three to two to one to none and then starting over again. That means we're spinning the meter backwards great. We have a sunny day. We're making more power than the house is using right now. So this homeowner is getting a credit right now as we speak. I also noticed that there's a label that says warning AC solar PV disconnect means is located and nothing appears to be written there. Um, is that something that a home inspector should call out? Absolutely. This is a case where we installed it with a sticker and we wrote on with Sharpie marker. That's not really a 30-year installation. We're going to replace this with an engraved placard. The reason this is important, the utility company requires the AC disconnect for safety reasons to be located at the same location as the meter. If it's not, you need to call out where it is. This particular label says, or used to say, that the PVAC disconnect is located on the northwest corner of the house where we were just a moment ago. So we should replace this because we want this to last for 30 years and we want the utility company to know where that disconnect is. And so also firemen. Firemen need to know where this disconnect is as well. So now there, there's a stamped data plate? We actually have an engraver at our shop that we engrave it into, into yellow and black plastic. Uh -huh. And what did this whole system cost a homeowner? And with his credits and uh, 
everything. In uh, in Colorado, PV systems range between eight and nine dollars a watt for an average retail so price. Fifty grand. This is close to fifty thousand dollars full retail price. But we have a really great incentive program from our utility company. It pays for between fifty to sixty percent of the system cost up front with a cash rebate. Wow, so it cost him under twenty five. And then on top of that, he got a he got a federal tax credit uh, for installing the system. On a residence, it's cap it's a thirty percent credit capped at two thousand dollars. In a commercial application, it's just flat thirty percent. Is there a website that anybody can go to to learn more information? You can check out what incentives are available nationwide via a database that's called the Database for State Incentives of Renewable Energy. That's for all states? That's for the entire country, and the actual URL is dsireusa.org. So it's desire without the I in front. And what's the website for your company? We're at namastesolar.com. So if you're interested in getting a PV system in the front range of Colorado, go to N-A-M-A-S-T-E-S-O-L-A-R.com. Okay. Well, guys, thanks for doing the show with us. Nick. Pleasure. It's been Thank a pleasure, you. Nick. Thanks Thank for you. coming. We'll see you next time.